Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Davenport, and I'm with... Heidi. Heidi oh, Hanlein. Right. <clears throat> and we have created the Wisdom Factory, which we broadcast every Friday evening. It's a forum for people who have experience, knowledge, and wisdom they want to share with the world. So we've been doing this for over a year now. We have these weekly live broadcasts, and we've had the different seasons. Uh, one season was called Wisdom Technologies, Inner and Outer Technologies, that was. Another is an ongoing Conversations That Matter. Uh, and uh, we have occasional uh, community gatherings. Too. And you are invited to join our community. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. What community is that? The Wisdom Factory community on Google+. Plus. That's how they'll find it. Very okay, good. Okay, good. So, we're interested in raising consciousness and spreading the wisdom of integral theory and showing how it is used in practice. That's our personal thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are coaches. Yeah, and, and counselors. Mm -hmm. And we're presently working on uh, relationships for the second half of life, which obviously includes us. <laughs> Very, mostly me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are presently broadcasting a series about uh, wisdom in relationships. And we call that Stop the Relationship. Grow your relation. <laughs> and we have 14 experts. And they all operate in an integral worldview. And uh, uh, earlier this series, we were concentrating more on personal and intimate relationships. But now we're creeping out and investigating more public ones, especially business relationships and their special concerns. And specifically today, that's why we have trust. Why is trust essential in our relationships? And our guest is David Ammerland. Uh, hello, David. Hello, guys. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, yeah, oh, and it's wonderful. so great that you came yeah. and be with us. Yes. And we have also yes. Melody as a co-host. And she is sort of a backup girl for us because if you have followed us, you have seen that we had quite a bit of internet problems and we had to change the location for our shows. And now we are back in Webinar, webinar Jam. Jam. And <laughs> thanks God I have now internet we have yes. satellite makes it possible mm -hmm. it takes a while to go there but somehow the speed is much much better so i hope you can see us okay. today all right much better about our guest yeah yes yeah. Okay. talk a little bit about david david is one of the very big names in google plus where he publishes regularly among other things his sunday read post which attracts a huge high-level following, and the discussions are very vivacious. Uh, I followed and got inspired by many of his conversations on Hangouts, for example, with Mar Martin Shervington. This is for me, because I'm a Plus Your Business mm -hmm. Academy member, That's and so right. I got to know you, let's say, personally in on screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I learned by dribble down from her, yes. yes. <laughs> David is the author of nine best-selling books, including SEO Help and Google Semantic Search, Google Hangouts for Business, and others. He writes for Forbes and for the HP UK and blogs on his own website, davidamerland.com. When he's not writing and surfing the web, he spends time giving speeches internationally on how search and social media are changing everything. But today he comes to talk about trust with us. Yes, he does. He's grounded within a very comprehensive view of the world and our roles in it, both individually and collectively. In a word, a philosophical approach to the very pragmatic work that he's doing. So it is no wonder that the role of trust is a concern of his, as it is to, to all of us who, who give trust to others and whose hope we wish and whose trust we wish to attract. So, without further ado, hello, David, again. <laughs> Could Hi, you correct well, anything <laughs> or maybe add anything? No, no, absolutely not. I think it's great. And thank you for that introduction. And right. trust, yeah, you're quite right. Trust is like.
is a key component of things which we do. Which we do. And it's a key component of the things which we do because of the relationship building which goes on throughout um, our connections, throughout our personal lives, throughout our business lives, and how everything sort of overlaps and comes together. That's a good beginning, a good introduction to what we want to talk about tonight. Uh, we also had some questions relating to trust. Mm -hmm. um, and first of all, why do we need trust for building relationships? <laughs> I mean, this is banal, a banal question. I am supposed to ask the dumb questions. Uh, okay, do it. Okay. You do it. <laughs> oh, you did. Sorry. Too late. <laughs> I think that's a great question. I think you know, we, we should say, why do we need trust at all? And usually, mm -hmm. when I introduce this in a corporate setting, I have a small sort of a, a mental game I play with it. And what I usually say is, suppose we reach an agreement which is worth many millions of dollars and it's governed by detailed contract pages, and we sit down and we agree on everything, I sign on every page, I put my name on every single page, agree to every single term. So I've agreed the contract, the deal is done. We stand up, the person, the other person puts their hand out to shake my hand, and I walk away. Would you trust me? <laughs> and they think about it, and they think no. And I'm saying, well, why not? I agree to absolutely everything. They can't usually tell me why not. But really the reason why we fail to trust somebody who behaves like that is because suddenly we suspect their intent. And what trust does in everything is it allows us to empathize with somebody else and understand why they do something. And if we can understand them, it takes a little bit of the mystery and the unknown out of it, which means it mitigates the risk involved in the... That's also at a personal level which then allows us to project the future so we know reasonably well what is expected in terms of, of events which are going to happen. If we take all that away, we don't trust anything. Anything can happen. And because anything can happen, then we live in a constant state of excitation, which means that our energy goes into that constantly, which means that nothing will be built in terms of quality in any kind of relational exchange. And I'm using the technical terms here, but we're talking about relationships. So if you're thinking, you know, there's an attractive person, I'd like to go out with them and, you know, you connect and you want to build a relationship which perhaps has a future, if you can't begin to trust your sense of them in terms of what you expect from them, who they are, how they're going to behave, then you can't trust your own judgment, which means you can't foresee the future, which means there is no future. So suddenly the relationship collapses. So yeah, yeah. We need trust. It's a, it's a mechanism. It allows us to do a few things. At a business level and also at a personal level, it reduces the risk in any kind of relational transaction. The moment we start building a relationship, the level of trust which is present or is not begins to tell us how things will go. We can choose to have a relationship with somebody we don't trust. The excitement factor is going to be pretty high, <laughs> but the relationship is going to be pretty <laughs> short. <laughs> so, you know, we make a choice. <clears throat> the other thing that trust does is it allows us to simplify life. So if, for instance, suppose we have a close relationship, the three of us, in terms of, you know, business transactions or even as a friendship, if I don't trust you, it means that I constantly need to question what you said, why you said it, try to second guess every situation, trying to sort of position myself so that I'm always having some kind of advantage. That takes a huge amount of energy. And this is just the three of us. You know, so if we had to invest in a relationship of just three people, we can't get anything else done. The world becomes a very chaotic, very difficult place to navigate. So as a defense mechanism, we tend to extend trust and have trust reciprocated back to us. And the moment I sort of trust you and you trust me back, it sort of normalizes things. We begin to work in a smoother way. There's no sharp edges. There's no unexpected turns. Communication improves. Empathy improves. Understanding improves. The relationship improves. 
and we have energy to devote to other things. So we can actually get more done. Yeah, I think um, we are sort of hardwired for having trust because without trust we couldn't survive. Yes. Uh, it begins from, from the little baby. If it doesn't, cannot trust uh, the mother that uh, it will get the milk or something else to eat, I mean, it's <laughs> it, it will not survive. And when our trust, our initial trust is disappointed, I think this will then transport into our whole life. We know it from psychology, you know, that people who in very early years have lost the capacity of trusting because of horrible experiences, yeah. they have a real difficulty in, in, in life to trust again. Mm -hmm. So what can they do, for instance, as we need trust, you said, also in business. By the way, it was for me so exciting when you said that in business you can restore trust quicker than in personal life. So these are now three questions together. <laughs> yes, okay. Let's begin with the, <clears throat> the hardest one first. If you don't personally feel you can trust anybody, how do you move forward? What do you do? And essentially that leads to a lot of introspection. We need to understand why we don't trust, break it down, analyze it, and then <clears throat> begin to devise a strategy which will allow us to trust in small steps. So for instance, you know, suppose that you are not willing to trust anybody, and we meet up and I say, you know, trust me in this, then we need to begin to build that relationship in very, very small steps which allow both of us to develop a kind of strategy which works. And that becomes the primary building block for, for bigger things. Now, as a strategy, that also works a little bit in business, but in business it's even easier to implement because business is very um, discreet in terms of how we create compartments. So essentially, and I'm going to use a classic example here, which is very much in the news, which is Volkswagen. And Volkswagen was a market leader. Um, it was ahead of Toyota. In 2014, in the middle of 2014, it was ahead of Toyota by um, a, a narrow margin, but it was quite significant. Uh, sorry, 2015. It closed the year. It closed 2015 um, because of the emission scandal with a loss in the last 10 years in sales. And it's continuing to exhibit a loss. Now, that loss is 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 the result of the fact that they betrayed public trust in a very public way and they failed so far to take ownership of their mistake they are deflecting they are um, sort of exhibiting behavior which is trying to um, pretend it's business as usual and the problem will go away and the problem is not going to go away we're still looking at them we still expect things from them so the question is what should they have done well okay they cheated and they lied Fine, that's, you know, but at the end of the day, we also understand that as a business, they themselves face specific targets and specific pressures, and at some point, uh, for whatever reason, whether it's an internal culture or, you know, a number of people or pressure from the leadership, it really does not matter, it became um, the obvious thing to do, to use technology to basically cheat. Fine, how do we fix this. Well, you see, they're going to say, look, we did it, and we're really, really sorry, but now we need to work really hard to gain back your trust, and this is how we're going to do it. First, this is what we're going to do to fix the problem, and this has to be visible, and it has to be transparent, and it has to be um, credible in terms of there have to be checks and balances to see from our side that they've actually done it. Second thing, they've got to say, this is what caused the problem in the first place whether it was the leadership or the culture or you know bad people or whatever you know this is what it is and this is what we're doing now to make sure it never happens again and the third thing is now they're going to say look we understand we've got to work harder than everybody else so this is what we're going to do and this is how you know we do it if they did those three things and they showed us how they did it within a year 24 months 36 months they would be back on top because their engineering the majority of their people, their know-how, their innovation hasn't gone away, it's still there. But right now it's suffering because 
they're not acknowledging the problem really, they're not taking ownership of their mistake, they're pretending, oh, you know, it wasn't that bad, you know, we didn't really lie, uh, it was kind of thing, but you know, it wasn't very big, it was huge, we trusted them and they betrayed us, and they're seeing this in the bottom line directly, and unfortunately, because of the complexities of the leadership of the company, and the way it's structured, um, they are not really displaying the kind of behavior which would allow them to get back to that. But within that formula, this is what they should have done. And this is what most people can do. You know, the moment trust is broken, you have to very visibly show what you're willing to do to gain it back and give the other person the means to actually check that you've done it. Yeah, and this mm -hmm. is also in personal life, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. I didn't uh, Toyota have its own scandal a very few years well, ago. Well, Toyota, yes. I mean, um, what Toyota had, um, it had, it suffered from it's um, a problem in the braking system, I think, which was caused mm -hmm. in some of its vehicles, and very, very recently, it was affected by the airbags they used, which was their supplier, and they were affected. I mean, they weren't the only ones affected. I think it was all, all also. Um, a couple of American brands were affected um, by the same by the same supplier, and it was quite sizable because they all sourced it. Um, they've all taken steps to basically fix this, and they've taken very visible steps. It's costing them a lot of money, and um, the fact that they've actually moved very quickly on this um, is shown. In, in the bottom line, you know, people still continue to buy their cars, they still continue to trust the company, they understand that there were problems that were fairly serious, but they've been fixed and they're being addressed. So at no point did they say, oh, it's not our fault, it was a supplier. Well, they chose the supplier, and although it was a third party, it still affected their vehicles, and people trusted their vehicles. We don't know where the airbags come from. So, yeah. you know, they all of the, you know, this is a different case where there, were, there was a, a case, an instance of trust becoming a little bit lower in them, and then it became, you know, it went back to the same levels as they enjoyed before, very quickly, because they got on top of it fairly quickly. So what you are saying is that we are moving towards transparency. Yes. Well, transparency. in a world, exactly. I mean, let's think why we're talking about trust right now. Um, Trust in, in our local communities, in our families, in our friends, it's it's instinctive. It is there. We don't really think about it very much. You know, you don't think about whether you're going to assess the trust you have in your immediate family members because it's there. You don't really think very much about how much you trust your friends because you know instinctively whom you can trust really well and whom you can't trust a lot, but you can trust them a little bit, and whom you shouldn't trust with some things, but you would trust them with other things. And all these complexities, we sort of work out just like this. Yeah. Then we come into That's the 21st it. century. Okay, yeah. let me see that um, to bring it in an integral context. This is what we have on the lower left side, the, the we space. Mm -hmm. In the we space, we know who is belonging to the we and who is not. So yes. sometimes we can be ero uh, erroneous, how do you say? We can we make fail sure. and we, we mm -hmm. think we belong to a, a group and we don't, or, or the other way around, you know. So it has to do a little bit, what we talked before in the green room also, it has to do a little bit with culture also. Yeah. And just to say, it, when mm -hmm. I came to Italy, I trusted everybody that they say, uh, next week on Tuesday at 4 o'clock we do blah, 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 you know. And I, with my German idea, I was there. They were not. And I asked them, I went, oh, did we? Oh, okay. <laughs> so it is just normal. <laughs> Here is normal that the day before you have to call or to write an email and to remind each other. Otherwise, the, the appointment well, is not, is not uh, how do you say? Valid. Uh, valid, mm -hmm. yeah. And in, in Germany, it's different. When mm -hmm. I say, I uh, in half a year on the uh, 15th of October at 7 o'clock, mm -hmm. I will meet you in... Rome in the restaurant X, Y, Z. This is enough, <laughs> at least culturally. It might be a little bit less now because people have too much in their head, but mm -hmm. culturally it's like that. Well, it is cultural. In, of course, the Italian for tomorrow is domani, and the, the Italian for the day after tomorrow is dopo domani. 
but that doesn't mean tomorrow. It means not today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some time after that. <laughs> it's after tomorrow. Yeah. So after well, not yet. <laughs> after not yet. Yes. <laughs> You're absolutely right in that culture plays a lot in terms of um, creating expectations, um, generating guidelines which guide behavior, um, allowing us to also project um, the, the way that other people will behave so that we know how we're going to behave and so on. So trust is always contextual. You know, we can't take trust from one environment, for example in Germany where or in Britain where people are very punctual and they really take you at their word because that's what they're used to. And then we take it into a Mediterranean setting and you expect it to work exactly the same way. It's not going to. And this is exactly why it is so complicated. And, and, and just to pick up on the reason we are now uh, spending so much time and energy looking at trust in today's world, well, the context of our interactions, the context of our connections and our relationship building has changed. You know, companies no longer um, sell locally, just locally, and no longer sell just to a market or out of a stall or out of a shop. They sell from a website to the entire world. People are creating connections and relationships based on digital connections on the web, you know, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus or even a Hangout like this one. We are basically building relationships, some complicated things, where they become personal or they become business, you know, they they build basically parts or aspects of life. To all of this, trust suddenly how we understand it, how we test it, how we begin to um, extend it to people who essentially we have never seen before it becomes an integral part of the conversation. And this is the, the space where our instincts sometimes can be right and sometimes they can be very wrong because we misread the situation, we misread the context and we don't know how, what we apply. So that's why we're having this conversation now in such an analytical way. This is why trust now has become a huge thing. You know, we you know we, we talk about business. Let's talk about brands. And we used to try to we used to like brands because we trusted them. Why did we trust them? Because they were huge. They spent a lot of money into building the brand, into having the skyscraper, having the mall, having the big shops. And you thought, well, if they spend that amount of money into all of this. Cheating a single person wouldn't make any kind of sense because they wouldn't make so much money as for them to be worth it. So therefore we tended to trust them because they wouldn't gain a lot out of cheating us as a single person. Whereas somebody who isn't a brand possibly could because their their costs are lower. Now when it comes to today's world, when brands are global, we know that they have the power to basically move so many people that cheating them now does make sense for them. Because of that, our sense of trust in brands now has changed because the context of our connection has changed. So it's not enough for a brand to come along and say, trust me, I want to be your friend, we want to do business, because we'll say, well, how do we trust you? Well, if they say, well, we have a, a skyscraper in Chicago, we'll say, so what? <laughs> that means nothing. Prove to me in a concrete way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, exactly. Well, you have to prove that you are like me. So, in a sense, in the modern world, a large component of trust comes down to what we call mutual vulnerability. And there has to be a symmetry in the relationship building, which wasn't quite there before. So, for instance, for a brand, for us to trust a brand a brand must be willing to trust us and we have a lot of power as individuals. If a brand says, yeah, sure, buy my stuff, but hey, you can't return it past 24 hours and if anything goes wrong, it's your fault. And you know, if you need to return it, shipping, you have to pay for that. You know, if they put all those barriers to something which makes them vulnerable, thinking that they don't want to be vulnerable because people will abuse it, which means they don't trust us, then we are unwilling to trust them. And let's think about Amazon, for instance, in this context. People buy stuff from Amazon from all over the world. Amazon have a policy where they accept stuff back, no questions asked. You know, if we think of this in a business context, 
think that's crazy. You know, people will take that Amazon will go out of business. What happens practically? Well, because Amazon are willing to take that chance, we are also willing to take a chance and buy from Amazon. And nine times out of ten, we are perfectly satisfied with the purchase. We don't return it. We don't abuse it. They do business, and we trust them because they were willing to actually trust us. And that's how a business begins to become more human, even though we have never met an Amazon employee really online. We have never seen anybody in the transaction process who is a human face and says, hey, I'm like you. But because they created the kind of thinking which shows the human values they actually believe in, shows that they actually thought like we would, allows us to feel that connection with them, then they become very humanized in our eyes and we begin to extend trust towards them. So that component of trust which we're thinking of today goes into that symmetry of the relationship. And if that's lacking, if the relationship is asymmetrical, then a matter of time when it's going to go wrong. Yeah, and I can add some experience with Amazon. We had um, twice they sent me a wrong Chromebook with the wrong uh, keyboard, and I had to send it back. And I had a person on the telephone, and it was perfect, you know? Yeah. And yeah. even I got the, the huge amount of money which I had to spend to bring it back. I got it back, and it was it was no problem at all. Why were in Italy when you want to give a thing back in a shop? They make a, a scandal, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was uh, I was on holiday in Perth, in Australia, um, a, a couple of years ago, and the hotel I was at had a shop which sold uh, sold um, little glass figurines, and I was in there. You know, I thought I better go and see them because you know maybe I would buy one. And they had signs everywhere: "You broke it, you bought it." <laughs> and the, I, you know, I was there like five minutes and I left. <laughs> you don't want to be in a place like that. No. no. You wanted to say something. Yes, but he talked and I forgot. Oh, yeah. too bad. <laughs> I apologize. I really do. Actually, no, there's, there's another aspect of this uh, I, I've noticed lately uh, that y this trust is a very flexible thing. You know, a giant, a giant in social media like Facebook is losing a percentage in among young people who are going to other kinds of uh, a social media. Uh, some some that are much more personal, some that erase the conversation as soon as it's sent, <laughs> you know, so that they have a, a, a kind of private, private uh, media to themselves and their friends and whoever they wish to be confidential with. Um, and uh, then they may have a Facebook account, but it's sort of their public face, you know, something that it doesn't matter who sees it. Aunt Gertrude won't be embarrassed by what I did on Saturday night, etc. Uh, and, and so th this is a marching, you know, one one step after another process of uh, what? Who do you trust? Who can you say what you want to and not, and not feel like it's going to be thrown up in your face? What, what I'm hearing here is that you say it is going towards mistrust. <clears throat> Well, there's an element of mistrust there, I think, or they wouldn't be leaving Facebook, mm. for example. Well, <clears throat> we live in a, in, a, in a funny world. In order to create trust everywhere, we need transparency. And if we need transparency, then we need to have access to data. We need to be able to independently verify who people are and what they do and, and so on which is great. The flip side of that, of course, is that the more data we generate and the more data we create, the more data we tend to give to those who give us access to this incredibly public platform. So Google, for instance, harvests data from individuals and harvests in, in, in a sort of positive way. I'm not using a negative term here. Um, and, and Facebook does the same and Twitter does the same and so on. And then the question and to bring it back to, to what Mark said earlier about culture, <clears throat> how do you then treat that data and by extension, how do you treat the relationship with individuals who actually give it to you? 
And this goes back to origins and philosophies which actually create everything. If we start from very small things, Facebook started from an environment where it was a very top-down approach. It started in academia. Um, it was very autocratic. It made the decisions unilaterally. It decided for its users. And anybody who didn't like it could just go and jump in the lake, metaphorically speaking. That culture, that approach, still persists today to a huge extent. And although Facebook itself is trying to change it, it is incredibly difficult to change internally because it started out like that and it grew like that and changing the culture is incredibly difficult. The thing of Google, who is arguably even larger than Facebook in its many different manifestations, it had a primary guiding principle which was a user comes first. And if we think Facebook is actually perhaps more personable than Google, who are pretty faceless. But because they give us access and control over what we do with our data, you know, you can Google Plus, you can download all your stuff, close your account and go away. That's it. The data is yours. And if you do the same thing with Facebook, well, you can't really close your account. You can suspend it. But they tend to keep the data in their servers because they say it's theirs, not yours. But you say, wait a minute, I generated it. It's mine. You go, no, no, you did it in my environment. Now, these kind of approaches begin to basically inform the relationship which we build. And people growing up today in that kind of world are very aware of the nuances of each platform. They're very aware of how they should themselves treat their data. And although we tend to think of environment as perhaps, you know, a little bit more open-minded and a little bit open-handed and a bit perhaps naive in terms of this. They're anything but that. They're very aware of how to um, <clears throat> hide what they do so that it doesn't, it's not as, as visible as it should be. They're very aware of the data which is kept and where it is kept and how to, to, to sort of fashion their profiles. And they do this without um, methodically thinking about it all the time. It's almost instinctive. So here again we see the sense of trust which guides an environment has an impact on that behavior, which then begins to affect everything else. So to, to take that massive picture and sort of boil it down, everything which we do in terms of trust starts small always at the face, at the, at the, at the point of the individual and their perception of it. And then it begins to grow and extend based on their awareness of how much trust is around them, whom can they trust, how they can be trusted back, and how all that creates a very complicated mechanism which leads to relationships, communities, organizations, countries, and then the world. We live in a world where arguably um, it's getting smaller in terms of the connections we make. It is getting more transparent, it's getting more visible. If we look at the news at any point in time, it is really, really bad. But that's because we see more of it. It's not that it is necessarily a worse world than it was. Because we see more of it, we obviously see the things which affect us immediately in terms of um, you know, wars and famine and, and, and diseases coming across and all sorts of things. At the same time, individually, we're beginning to work out the strategies which allow us to create relationships across the globe, to create communities with members from all over the world, to create trust within those communities. These are the seeds of a future. And we may not see that future directly ourselves. People coming after us will, because the world is actually getting smaller. Countries are getting closer together. People are getting closer together. And because inevitably, countries will get closer together. So, you know, it's all heading in a very positive direction because of our inclination to extend trust and use trust as a means of basically navigating the world and making life very livable. And we all understand that at, at a very deep personal level, which then extends to everything outside us. Great. Yeah. I, I would have a, a question. There are people who are constantly mistrusting. They tr mistrust Google, they mistrust uh, Chrome, they mistrust, I don't know what, whatever, you know, whatever yeah, comes up, uh, whatever is in, in the internet is uh, mistrust for, uh, for, for some people. What, what do you say about that? Well, there, there are always two ways of doing things. And <clears throat> it's fascinating when people say, well, I don't trust Google. And then you see them perhaps using Google Search, being on Google Plus and saying that, using Gmail. And, and here's what happens. 
despite what you say, if there is absence of trust, in the absence of trust, this connection between me and you is not even a, qu a question. It doesn't exist. If I absolutely do not trust you and you don't trust me, we have nothing to do with each other. So the moment there's a connection, there may be mistrust, but mistrust doesn't mean complete absence of trust. It just means uh, perhaps confusion about your intent, confusion about our relationship and how it's developing, confusion about how we can go on from here. That's perfectly fine. And I think an element of mistrust within that context is perfectly understandable. And to some degree, it is desirable. I don't think, I mean, it's great for all of us to say the world is a perfect place. We all want to trust each other and move forward. We know that it can't work like that. We need to work out safeguards. We need to work out ways of basically measuring trust and understanding other people. We need to understand sometimes why trust breaks down. Why do relationships go wrong? Why wars happen? Why does crime? These are things which we need to understand. And the only way we can understand them is by asking those questions. So when somebody says, well, I don't trust Google. Yes, they're a great company. Yes, their heart is in the right place. Yes, they're perhaps better than most companies like them. That doesn't make them a perfect company. And if we blind ourselves to the fact that they also face pressures of their own, then we're going to end up with another VW, a fantastic company, great engineering, great people, up to the point when things went wrong because they weren't, because they abused their power. So these are questions which are good to have. And when somebody says, I mistrust things and they're still here or they're still asking questions, well, you know, it's just a... Um, a a great opportunity to have the kind of conversation which allows us to understand the dynamics of our environment. And also, it allows us to personally sometimes explore why are we trusting perhaps the same organization a little bit more? Is our experience different, knowledge base different, has nobody else does, or the word, you know, the opposite? This is something which we shouldn't do and everybody else does and we don't. So I think having that kind of um, context in the online conversation is great. I think there's always a place for people who say, oh, I don't trust this. Oh, I'm not sure about this. Um, and, and we should always you know, work to see their perspective and, and try to get across our perspective. Anything and everything which has to do with trust has also to do with relationships. Anything and everything which has to do with relationships has to do with communication. As a species, we're extremely bad at communicating. We are terrible communicating within our own family sometimes. And this is something which needs to work. Without clear communication, it is very difficult to create trust. Without clear communication, it is very difficult to go across cultures and expect to have a trustworthy environment and create relationships which can be trusted between you know, different people or different organizations. And, and this is exactly why, in the business context, organizations take such a long time to create very detailed legal contracts which cover almost everything. It's not a thing they expect things to go so wrong, or, but this is part of their communication process. They're letting the other party know that, hey, you know, I'm trying really hard to cover everything so we both know exactly where we stand. And what we usually find in business relationships is that, you know, in the first instance, we start off with, you know, your lawyers and my lawyers, my contract and your contract, and let's look at them. Let's go over every clause. And, you know, 20 years down the line, that same relationship is done over a phone call. It says, hey, you know, we've got a new product coming online. You're going to come in and partner us. And somebody says, yeah. Same thing with people. You know, initially, obviously, we don't have teams of lawyers, but we are very cagey. And if you think of how we approach a new social group, we'll be very careful about what we say about ourselves. You know, we won't reveal a lot of personal information. We will say, we'll always sort of professional information because that gives us professional status, which is a certain amount of safeguard, and, and so on. And then, you know, if you become friends with the same people, 20 years down the line, you're at a party, you know, you're both drunk, somebody says something really stupid, and it just goes over your head. Oh, yeah, you know, whatever. Because you can just completely ignore it within that context. It doesn't become a deal breaker in your relationship or anything like that. I'm going to steal the phrase measure trust 
from you. I like that. Okay. How do you do that? <laughs> Get, use, a, use a trustometer. Yeah, this one. <laughs> oh, I don't get it. Let's see it. <laughs> no, trust Donald. I trust you. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Good question. Should trust have length or should it have height? Or should it have degrees? Like, I think, you know, I think, I think a circle. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great question. How do you measure trust? If we think that trust is always contextual, this is why it's so difficult. It is part of an ever-evolving relationship, which means everybody's changing within that context. So, for instance, suppose suppose we have a 30-year relationship, and you say, oh, when I first met you, remember, we were at the party, we're all drunk and throwing stones at the police, for instance. And we bonded over that, right? But that context today, would be, whoa, are you kidding? You did that. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> so essentially, you know, it shows that we all move along and trust is constantly being measured in a dynamic by the actions of everybody involved. So <clears throat> depending on the strength of our relationship, for instance, I would have some leeway to break the trust you extend to me within some contexts. You know, maybe I can break it a little bit and it's not a deal breaker. Maybe I can break half of it and it's still not a deal breaker. Or maybe I can do something which is really, really bad and that, that is a real bummer. So that is measured always in that context. Yeah, this is really great that trust is developing. It's not something you have. I, I tell you, have trust in me. I don't trust you as a person and you have never seen me. Uh, <laughs> How can well, you? No? <laughs> yeah, you know, the most suspicious thing anybody can ever tell you is, trust me. You think, whoa! <laughs> Immediately, <laughs> all you think about is, no, I won't! <laughs> and, and again, you know, th this goes back to our instincts. Because we measure ourselves constantly, you know, how much we should trust other people or not trust them. The moment somebody actually says, trust me, which means that they're hard selling the situation, alarm bells go up. And you think, you know, um, I would want to sort of make my own judgment in my own time. So I don't want to be forced into anything. And if you're trying to force me into something, well, you know, this is one more reason why I shouldn't perhaps trust you. So that kind of constant evolution also shows why trust is so difficult for businesses to develop and keep. We trusted VW. They worked really hard for that trust. You know, their engineering, incredible. Their customer service was really good. Their products were great. They didn't get to be like that by taking things lightly. They really put their heart and soul into it. It's not automatic. It's a constant thing. When they broke it, this is what they failed to understand. Because they broke it, but essentially they're still doing the same things behind the scenes in terms of engineering and quality and everything, they fail to understand how we are affected. The empathy bit is lacking, at least at, at the customer-facing level. So they think, well, you know, we still produce the same cars. What's the problem? You can still trust them. And now we say, no, we can't, because you lied once. This is and you're German. Not this is German. Rationality is so important, you know, and it not is. to see. Yeah, I, I accept that. <laughs> I totally accept that. And, and I know that, you know, from a cultural point. But, you know, they work across the world, and they work as at a human level. So, really, they've got to think, and this is where empathy comes in. They've got to think not in terms of what they're doing, but in terms of how they're being perceived. So, if, for instance, we're thinking, well, you lied to us once, and you kept on lying, and we had to find out, and when we did, you tried to hide it, and you haven't admitted it, and you're not fixing it, and you're not really telling us what you're doing, so you haven't, the problem is still there. And they're thinking, no, it isn't. You know, okay, that was it. Now we're not doing it. I said, well, how do we know? Show us. Make us part of what you're doing. Feel how we are feeling, not how you are feeling. Because they're failing to do that, well, it's costing them millions. Yeah, and you know what I think, it is really has to do with the upbringing of the individuals. We are sort of 
raised in this way to say no, it was not me, and uh, sort of lying behind the 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 um, the, the back. Mm -hmm. And only a short time ago, I heard a friend of mine saying a psychologist has said to her, a person gets only is then an adult when they lie to their mother. And I said, oops, <laughs> what is that, you know? Oh, wow. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we can come into the integral context here. It has to do with the levels of development, where you are. You know, in a certain level, you would hide your, your failures, and you would negate it. Mm -hmm. And then when we come to our levels, we begin shame. with green, mm -hmm. and then we go into integral. Mm -hmm. We really want uh, transparency, and we have understood if everything is transparent, what can happen anymore? You know, if you are yeah. really yeah. truthful to me and I to you, we we have no reason to to fear anything. Mm -hmm. And and well, I think that the world will go there. I hope so. But what is your idea? <laughs> Well, Heidi, you're making a very important point here, which, which again Mark raised earlier in terms of the, the strength of culture and what would have been perfectly fine within a very tightly constrained German culture is it, of what's, what's happening. They understand, for instance, that if things go wrong and it's public and the company says, well, you know, ah, it wasn't really our fault, everybody knows that they're trying really hard to fix it and they're going to fix because this is the understanding of the culture because it works in a slightly different way and if you take the same thing in a Japanese culture where you know everybody gets there's so much um, uh, reputation at stake and everybody takes ownership and it's really bad to make mistakes and you have to publicly apologize again we understand that but when you have a global culture it creates a kind of difference because then you have to overlook the cultural um, differences and look for the cultural similarities. And the cultural similarities are what make us human. You know, I'm British or Australian, you're German, the other person is American. We all have different cultures we come from. But as people, there's a, a huge overlap in our interests, in our values, in the way we see the world. And that's what actually brings us together. And that's how companies should actually humanize their behavior. But for that to happen, they need to feel that they themselves are part of that equation. They need to show us how they're part of that equation. And then we begin to feel that human connection towards them. It's what Amazon does so well, algorithmically, but they really do it really well. And what perhaps other companies fail to do, even though they go into a lot of trouble and put people in, in front of the, of the company trying to be the public face and so on. So really, it's that kind of approach which creates a complexity, which puts internal pressure on organization, which then forces it to really think about its values. And because they don't do that, what do we see? We see disorganization, we see mistakes, we see inconsistencies where one part of the organization does this and the other part says that and the two things don't really add up. And that allows us to see that, hey, they're consistent. Their values on nothing isn't right. We can't trust them in that context, which means we can't really have a real relationship with them. And if we can't have a real relationship with them, as customers, we're not really their customers and they don't have us and perhaps opportunistically we might take advantage of a good deal they may have there, but they don't really have our custom and they're struggling. And that again shows how complicated the world has really become and what a challenge it is to be transparent, open, um, willing to take chances, willing to trust people, willing to appear wrong and then willing to set things right. You know, these are these are all the, the human things which brings us all together as opposed to, you know, my values, my company, apart from you, which tend to basically divide us. Us and them. <laughs> yes. It doesn't work. Uh, Melanie, you haven't yeah. said anything. Would you like to ask or share something? Yeah, well I I'm just absorbing so much great information. And uh, I did. I something does come to mind, and it's only because I live in America, and we have these American politicians, and you know, we have we have the extremeness. We have somebody that is very bully-like, uh, 
uh, says what he wants to say, and rather than you would, you know, like normally you would think, how can people trust that person when he's so blunt and insulting and everything? And then the people who trust that person, their explanation is because he's so honest and open, he's transparent. It's like, but but it doesn't mean. Uh, you know, I think that transparency also has to come with good manners and being polite and nice. <laughs> because if 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 you're if you have your trust measurement with uh, like wow they're transparent, that doesn't mean that they should be trusted. So what do you think about that kind of situation? That's Melanie. Thank you for making that point. Um, that's a very important thing because. Essentially, we saw, we've seen so far in the discussion how complicated trust is when it comes to actually seeing how it's created, how it's measured, how it evolves. And you know, let's come to the polarization, the current polarization of American politics, which is not unique. It's also reflected in polarization in British politics right now, polarization across Europe in you know countries which joined later and countries which were there to begin with. And we have to ask why. And one of the primary reasons, and not the only one, but one of the primary ones right now um, for this kind of beer is that people are fed up with traditional politics because for a long time, or rather, let's say, they're fed up with the established way of doing things because so far it has failed to deliver the kind of change that we have actually come to expect to see. Because they feel so fed up and betrayed by the establishment, they tend to new ways of expressing that or new people who will bring new hope. That's perfectly natural and perfectly ordinary, even though sometimes from our perspective it may be deplorable. So transparency in its own is not enough. We need to see the actions, we need to understand the motives, we need to understand the intent, we need to understand the context into which all this is happening. And if that's good, it ever comes to it that suddenly, let's say, Donald Trump come becomes the, the president of the United States against all odds. I know, I know. <laughs> let's suppose that happens. The lessons that will be learned from that kind of mistake, which will be tragic in my opinion, um, are lessons which will benefit us all, believe it or not. So I think always when something happens, which seems hugely logical, hugely wrong, you know, it shouldn't have happened. We can say that in retrospect with a certain amount of, you know, um, of, of hindsight which gives us that ability at the time when it does happen, it appears the next logical step. And, you know, none of us, we must remember, if, there's, if we should trust in something always, is we should trust in people trying to move forward for what's best for them, which also becomes best for everybody else, generally speaking. And as a humanity, we've always taken that path. So even if we look at, you know, really tragic events in history, World War II, World War I, you know, it, it can't really get worse than that. There are millions of people dying, incredible suffering, atrocities that should never ever be repeated. Well, the reason they happened, the reason these things happened is because we had those polarities in our world, you know, who created those situations which made them happen. And we learned from them a little bit not to repeat those mistakes, which allows us to move forward. So, you know, I always take the view that, you know, hopefully I always hope for the best of what's going to happen, but individually, all of us, each of us, it's very, very small, and the world's a very big place. So if something bad does happen, well, we will learn from it, overcome it, and that's where the strength of us actually appears, in the ability to overcome these things, in the ability to feel betrayed, feel wounded, and yet surface from that and work again in a way that builds trust, builds relationships, builds, you know, there are in countless instances of you know, Holocaust survivors, they survived concentration camps where, you know, there's, there's absolutely no way you can imagine what they suffered yeah. and how it affected them. And yet, they came out of that and they became people functioning in a normal way, in a normal world. They did not become monsters, they did not go into killing sprees, they did not 
distrust every single individual they ever met. And you think, you know, if they can do that, <laughs> that's amazing. You know, that's a miracle of, of, of the human spirit. You know, it's, there's hope for us all. Perfect. Well, <laughs> I, Thank you, David. <laughs> that was good. That was a, a nice overview. I would like, before we close, I just have to mention that <clears throat> Italy has survived Silvio Berlusconi. So if worst <laughs> comes to worst, we will survive Donald Trump. <laughs> Absolutely. So America is different than Italy. Yes, it uh, is. It's mm -hmm. When we talk in integral speech, it's a different level of development than, mm -hmm. uh, than America. So for America, it would be a fallback much bigger than it was yeah, here. Yeah, it would be much more dramatic. Silvio was sort of representing a quite a... A big, 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 big chunk of the population. So, admired yeah. <laughs> like man. Oh mm. gosh. Yes. Yeah. Well, we've come a long way in this yeah, hour. It was yeah. great, great, great. Mm -hmm. And I would love to repeat that another day, to to talk about that. It is it's still so much to explore in this mm -hmm. topic about trust. And Melanie, I remember your show when you talked about, you know, in the modern world how it is important to show up trustworthy in because it might be seen your bad behavior yeah. and it will never be erased from as we talked before Facebook never erases Google <laughs> it, it was new to me thank you for the information you can take all your information away this is this is really great so you know in some way it might be an educative uh, effect that people really refrain from doing bad stuff <laughs> <laughs> publicly at least, you know. So I, I would love to, to extend this conversation uh, another time with you, David. Uh, really, yeah, sure. really great. Absolutely. Yeah. And we will uh, close for today yeah. and tell everybody who is viewing, we are going over to Plab where you can come in and we will talk about what we heard. I'm sure something was new to you as it was for me. And we talk between each other. I don't know if you can be there. Otherwise, we talk about you. Yeah, we <laughs> talk about you. <laughs> oh, great. And Melanie, great oh. that you were here and to help us. And I hope from now on we will fly with the internet. Oh, yes. So far, and one of my nice. two months long anxieties will finally yeah. calm down a little bit. Thank you everybody for watching. Oh, it's great. great. And come back next great week. Show. Next week we will have Alex um, Howard, who is doing very, very interesting work. I don't know if you know it. Conscious too. He is doing very professional uh, transmissions and interviews and, and courses. He is in mm -hmm. England, uh, based in England, and it's all about growth and development and uh, he will talk about how to balance this mission to go out into the world, give all your energy to the project and still have a private life and, you know, family and so on, how to, how to go on with this, let's say, gap. <laughs> and I think many of us who are so excited to do the work we are doing to bring out our message, many of us have this gap. What private life? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll see you over in Blab. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.